As we look, and the message title this morning is Final Words, Real Letter, Real People, and what's the last one there? Real what? Real Life. Let's read that out loud together. Real Letter, Real People, Real Life. Uh, Take your Bible and turn to Titus, and let's look again with me. Uh, If you would, I've included a large box there of the passage, and verses 12 through 14 is what we'll actually be looking at this morning, but let's review a little bit. For those that are new to us this morning, we always want to do a very brief review so you know what this is about. The Apostle Paul, notice there under context and review, the Apostle Paul has left missionary Titus on the island of Crete to straighten out wayward churches. Now, this is an island in the middle of the Mediterranean. It was an island that many people would sail to on their way somewhere else. And those, those sailors that would go there and all of those people that lived on that island were a pretty rough crowd. And so the churches that were there had not had good leadership. They had problematic leaders. They had problematic doctrine. And what is the last one there? They had problematic behavior. They weren't acting like Christians. And so their doctrines were messed up, their leaders were messed up, and so were their churches. Notice the next part here. The churches, the Cretan churches, those churches on Crete, they had spiritually corrupt leaders. Fill that in. They had spiritually corrupt leaders. Kind of sounds like our day and time. There's many spiritually corrupt leaders within Christendom. You can look at the news and you often hear scandals. You often hear scandals involving money. You often hear scandals involving sex. You often hear scandals involving power and division and many of those things. And all of that impressed upon the name of Christ. All of that impressed upon the name of His church. And so we we see that even though this was written 2,000 years ago, it is a constant ongoing problem of Satan's war against God's people. And very often it comes through churches not being careful. So in pursuit of their own gain, this is part of that paragraph, in pursuit of their own gain, they had brought great confusion to the churches. Titus was giving the task of straightening this out. Wouldn't, have you, wouldn't you like to have been Titus? You got all these churches that are, that are all over the island, And they have bad leaders that are involved in all kinds of controversies. And and notice what he's told to do. And number one, we looked at this last week, true leaders and true churches must turn away from, we said, wasteful distractions from the gospel. If you have room there next to from the gospel, put on there, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And what is the main thing? The main thing is salvation in Jesus Christ. The main thing is the fact that God has reconciled his people to himself through himself. That is the person of Jesus Christ. And by his sacrifice on the cross that we would come to be in right relationship with God. And if we ever forget that, if we ever get distracted with the other things and we, uh, we begin to worship other ideas, we begin to worship other ideologies, we begin to mix in other things to this great act and work of God, we begin to dilute the most important truth that a human could ever come to know is that there is a loving God who loves him so much, loves her so much, that God himself would come and endure the sacrifice of Christ for our sins. Notice here in verse 9 it says, and we see this is what we studied where we get that number one from. In verse 9 it says, but avoid, circle the word avoid. That's, that's what they're supposed to do. They're to turn away from it. They're to avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are what? Unprofitable and and worthless. How many churches have obsessed about things that are worthless? The color of the carpet, or trying to create some emotional experience that's here at the moment and gone the next. You see, the truth of the gospel is to go with us in mind and in heart, in logic and in passion as we leave this building living out the truth for God. Look at number two. True leaders in true churches 
must reject what? Divisive individuals. We recognize that Satan loves to send divisive individuals into local churches, into local church families. And those divisive individuals just love to bring about factions or they love to bring about hurts between groups or individuals in the life of the church. This is a common tactic of Satan. He does it, we see throughout the New Testament, and we see that he's done it throughout human history. And if he can divide the church, then he ruins the church's witness. I have shared with you before that in Arkansas, where I um, served and and worked for a while, um, while I was in seminary, I went to seminary in Tennessee across the Mississippi River, and I would drive over into the rice fields of um, Arkansas, and drive 65 miles out into the country. And out in the country, there is a church that is there. It's a white, typical, traditional-looking church. And on one side, there are gray asphalt shingles on one side of the church. And on the other side of the, of the building, there are green asphalt shingles. And do you know why there's gray asphalt shingles and green asphalt shingles? Because there were people in the church that felt so strongly about what color the church ought to, the shingles, the new church, the roof shingles ought to be, that they came up with a compromise. And it was, it was a statement to the community that this church could not get together on this need to be, to be unified in this. So it was a very vivid statement constantly to the community that the church was very divided. And and now Satan does that very often um, in the life of the church, very often through divisive people. Look at verse 10, it says, as for a person who's, this is under number two, in verse 10 it says, as for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Wow. Some of you would say, that doesn't sound very Christian. We said last week, oh, that's very Christian, and for protection of the church. And... It's a merciful thing to that person that he would start to realize that he's not acting like a Christian and he has been put out of the church hoping that he will repent of that and come to see his need for Christ. Look at verse 11. 11, Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Now, as we come to verses 12 through through 14, uh, we come to these issues that I call some final words. Have you ever noticed that final words are often important? Final words um, are, are those instructions that are often given to somebody right at the end of something, and those final words are saying the most, uh, just very often the, the thing that, they're the last reminder, if your kid is going out with his friends for the night, mom and dad very often would say, okay, we're new to this, he's going out with some friends, and we've, we've, we've carefully vetted this situation, hopefully, and you give your child a few last-minute reminders. And what are some last-minute reminders that you might give your child as he leaves? Oh, remember who you are would be one of them. Remember who you are. And not only remember who you are, but I think somebody may have said, remember whose you are. Now, I heard that one. I don't know who said that over here, but um, I heard that very often when Andrew Coleman was going out the door as a 16-year-old and a 17-year-old. Clell Coleman would say, son, you remember whose you are. Now, he meant that in two ways. He meant that that I was Clell and D. Coleman's son and connected to them, but he also meant that you are God's. And you act in such a way that you are honoring God. What are some other things? Maybe even more trivial. What are some other things that you would say? Okay, be careful in how you drive. Put on your seatbelt. Nowadays, cars, I don't even think they go forward without seatbelts on. I mean, so that's kind of a thing from the past, I guess. Or it dings so much, it drives you crazy, you have to put it on. But, um, you you know, whoever can hack that, I would be interested in you hacking. No, uh, I'm just kidding. We, we, we have these last-minute warnings that are kind of important, um, and we, we have words that are, I mean, when you, when you see the Normandy invasion about to begin, 
If you've done any study on that, from the highest commanders of Winston Churchill and Dwight D. Eisenhower and the others that were overseeing that great effort, there were, there were final words that were very important, and many of those final words would make it all the way down to the troops who were going to that great climactic moment that the fate of the world, to some degree, would rest upon those efforts. And so those final instructions were so very important, and very often a recap of what had been said. We see a little bit of that here. We see some personal notes that are important, but then we see a final word that's very, very important for the church and for Titus. So look with me in verse 12. He says, at at the end of all of these, these these three chapters, he says, when I send Artemis and Tychus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Verse 13, do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. Now look at verse 14. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. As from As, excuse me, all who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Now, Christians very often in studying the Bible either take the opening words of one of the letters of the Bible uh, of the New Testament or the final words, and we often gloss over them. This is evidenced very often in the commentary writers that very often you will see these opening statements either by Paul or by John or by others, and there's very little comment made about very important statements at the beginning of one of the letters or at the end of the letter. At Sheridan Hills, we believe that every word in this Bible is important and that every word here has something to do with your life and my life. And so we want to pay take, take special attention and see why the Holy Spirit may have included these words for us 2,000 years later. One of the things that I want you to notice and just observe and then to also be able to apply, and that's what all these are going to be, both observation and application as we go very quickly this morning, I want you to see, number one, that these are real letters. These are real letters. In fact, verses 12, 13, and 14 show us that this is actually a letter written from one person to another person, and they're from and to real people. These are not fictitious letters written to fictitious people. These are real people, and they live in, fill it in, in real places. These are real places on the earth. The places still exist. There's not a black hole there. It's still there. It may not be a city still there. Nicopolis is not really still there as a thriving city. We can go and see the Roman ruins that are all around. But these real letters to real people in real places are about real issues. Now, the last one there is very interesting because we've seen throughout our study of Titus that the things that the church was dealing with in Crete 2,000 years ago is very similar to the things that the church is dealing with in Broward County in Hollywood, Florida, right here in 2018. Very, very similar real issues. And there's not a lot about humanity that really changes other than Jesus Christ coming and transforming us we often have the same sin struggles and the same sin nature, and this church very often deals with the same sin strategies um, of Satan upon it. So to be clear, fill it in, first bullet point, to be clear, the Bible is nonfiction. I'll never forget after we moved to France, we went to, I love bookstores, Marcy and I love bookstores, the girls love bookstores, our, our two daughters, and we went to Uh, churches, and we were just, uh, churches, we went to bookstores in France, Um, there it's called a library, Um, but um, as we, as we were there, I would look all through the store, and I often found the Bible in the non, excuse me, in the fiction section of the, of the bookstores, and just kind of think about that, in the fiction section of the bookstore, not the religious section, or not um, in beliefs or, or life, anything like that. It was in the fiction section of the bookstore. Not always, but often. Uh, I want us to understand as Christians, the Bible is nonfiction. 
It is completely true, and it's completely real, and it is completely active in all of these things. Notice here with me, and we see this in these verses, that there's biographical and geographical information, just write bio and geo, biographical and geographical information there. There are spiritual issues there. There are moral issues there. These are very real issues in our lives. And there are theological realities. See, all of these are very real things that are present in these letters. And this is part of what lets us know we're not talking fiction here, we're talking nonfiction. These are real events. You see, God's Word, fill this in, God's Word was divinely revealed through human experiences. Old Testament, these are human experiences that God is working to reveal His truth, to reveal His plan, to reveal His eternal words. He reveals them through Moses. He reveals them through the prophets. He reveals them through the poetry of the Old Testament. And then He comes and He reveals them through the workers of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the letter writers, the epistles that are written, the letters that are written to the churches, and to the revelation given to John. These are divinely revealed truths of God working in His plan through human experiences and through human histories. I remember as an eight or nine-year-old living about four streets over, right over here at 2118 North 39th Avenue, and I remember playing out in the front lawn along the street And as an eight or probably seven or eight year old, eight or nine year old, I remember being out there and one of the other kids in the neighborhood, this was a time when there were many, many children living in Hollywood Hills, many families had moved in in the 60s and in the 70s and uh, lots of young families over there. And I remember playing with another child there in the street and somehow we got on the discussion of religion and As an eight-year-old, I heard another eight-year-old say, well, do you really believe the Bible? I said, well, of course. And he said, oh, my dad says the Bible is just an old book written by one or two old guys. They just sat down and they wrote the Bible. Now, I heard that as an eight-year-old in the 70s. Um, I remember, I mean, that's street conversation of eight-year-olds in the 70s. Um, as, we, as we look at that, we, we have to recognize that one of Satan's main attacks over the last 150, 160 years has been on what we call the veracity or the reliability of the Bible. And we see this has happened through what we call the modern age or what we call modernism as we, we came out of the Enlightenment where many things began to to grow scientifically and to grow into the modern age. And as modern technology began to develop and to grow, there there came a doubt of God's Word. In fact, this is one of the things that killed Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was brokenhearted over the pulpits of England where pastors would no longer stand and look academically, scholastically, spiritually why this indeed is the Word of God, why you can say that with complete and utter confidence and faith. As, As science began to rise as the new God, as technology and, and industry began to rise as the new God, the words of God began to be viewed as antiquated and out of style and out of fit. Oh, oh come on, you don't really, I mean, didn't you read Darwin? I mean, didn't you really see the science in this? I mean, and so we, we begin to, to see this. Even Harrison Ford this week was quoted that we shouldn't be paying any attention to anyone that does not believe in science as if people who believe the Bible don't believe in science. My friends, I I, I believe that Sheridan Hills needs to understand that this is a, a very, very real book with a very, very real God who is teaching a very, very real message of love and unity toward the things of his grand plan and that we can rely upon this. He has divinely revealed this. Scientific study is not in opposition to the truths of Scripture. In fact, if you study science honestly and you study the Scripture, you see that there is this beautiful marriage of the two. 
Our bookstore is full of books on that because that is a big issue to me. In fact, there's a book in there that's called Undeniable. And if you have questions over science, and especially in the areas of evolution, if you have questions over the message of the Bible and science and whether or not they are compatible together, you need to go buy the book Undeniable. It is, it is a glorious work describing how God's Word is completely reliable when it deals with science and in relationship to that. So this is the divinely revealed plan of God through human experience. Look at the next one that's here. God's Word is real, is as real and relevant today as it was when it was first given. Again, right out there to decide the issues of Titus. Um, if you look at the issues of Titus, they are very, very relevant to our present day and time. I want Sheridan Hills to understand the last statement that is here very clearly. This should be on our heart. All of Scripture applies to all of life for all people. All of Scripture applies to all of life for all people. You may open the Bible and read in some area of the Old Testament or the New Testament something that seems very, very obscure. You may, you may read an aspect of the Bible that you go, what in the world does that mean? How does that fit? Oh, that must not matter anymore. It's all about Jesus and him crucified. And so we, it doesn't really matter this section of the Old Testament or this section that is here. And I would say to you, don't turn your sheet over yet. I heard it. I heard it. I saw it. Listen. All of Scripture applies to all of life. We need every verse of the Bible. You, as you begin to become a student of the Bible, and as you begin to look at the big picture of the Bible, you can see creation, fall, redemption, glory, and that those obscure passages very often in the Old Testament, if you study a little bit, if you see what God is doing in it, you begin to see His hand working through history. You begin to see that this reveals either something about him or something about us that we desperately need to know pointing to life in Jesus Christ. And so don't give up on the Word of God. Don't let your lack of knowledge or something that doesn't quite understand cause you to doubt and wonder if something is relevant. I want to say to you that all of Scripture applies to all of life. And then with the last one there that we have there is for all people. You say, well, not the guy that lives next door that doesn't know the Lord. Oh, no, it applies to him too. He just doesn't realize that. And in fact, it may be that he lives there next door to you and he begins to see your life and he begins to hear your life and through your, maybe your community group or other things, as you begin to pray for him and you begin to care for her, you, you reach out to them and they come and they come to where they didn't think that God's word had anything to do with them, that they come to learn that God's word has everything to do with them. You see, that's what God does. And so we cannot get away. There's no missions, there's no evangelism. Listen, there's no church life apart from all of Scripture. If we are truly God's people, then we need to be safely in all of his word. And yes, you can safely turn your page over there. Um, look at that. Um, in fact, we carry on that very thought with the real people. Um, we see Artemis, Tychus, Zenos, and Apollos. So there's four of these that are listed in the passage. Look at the passage there in the box or on the screen. It says, and when I send Artemis or Tychus to you, do your best to, co to come to me at uh, Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. We're going to see who these guys are. See that they lack nothing. Now, first of all, we, there's four names that are given here of people, Artemis, Tychus, Zenos, and Apollos. And then we also see real places. Already we've looked at Crete, the whole idea of Crete being out there in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, in fact, look at the screen, um, look at this map, for those of you who are new to us, Crete right there in the center of the Mediterranean. And then uh, up at Nicopolis, here, that is a town up in modern-day Greece. 
any of you who have been to Greece, you know that's a very beautiful part of the world. You say, yeah, I would like to have been, you know, Titus. He was living in a great place, a beautiful place. Yeah, that's kind of cool. But these are real places. Here's the ruins at Nicopolis. I mean, these, it was a Roman city. In fact, it was established by Augustus in about 37 B.C. And so by the time that Paul comes along, it's been there for 100 years. It's a growing, going place. There's churches that are there. And Paul is planning to, okay, I think I can make it there by the time that winter comes. Now look at the Mediterranean. Mediterranean was pretty big. In fact, the Mediterranean, if you were to go from over around Israel on the far um, east end of the, of the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the Straits of Gibraltar, um, at the end over there by Morocco and uh, modern-day Spain, the United States would about fit in that area from one end to the other. So it's, it, the Mediterranean Sea is not that small. It's a, it's a large sea. And I, I want you to notice one of the other things that shows us that this is a real word. Um, just look at p verse 12 where it says at the end of verse 12, Paul writes and he says, for I've decided to spend what? the winter there in that place. So here we even see these are real times. There, here we see the reality of winter is mentioned. Now why is the reality of winter mentioned? He's going to spend the winter there. Let me tell you that in the Mediterranean world, the sea that you've just been looking at, in the Mediterranean world in the first century when this was written, you didn't travel around on the Mediterranean Sea in the wintertime unless it was absolutely necessary. Do you know why? That was on Valentine's Day 2005. How would you have liked to have been on that ship? Some of you have been on a ship before. And some of you said, now I'm never going on a ship. <laughs> there are storms that come up on the Mediterranean. That was just off of Mallorca, Spain. There are storms that come up on the Mediterranean that are incredibly powerful storms that can even cause cruise ships and and tankers and various other things to have great trouble. Luckily, that, or fortunately, that, that ship made it. Um, it lost some engines from a wave coming over and smashing the windows uh, way up high on the bridge and caused the, the bridge area to be flooded and they lost engines, uh, control of the engines over that. And um, they were able to keep one engine working. I mean, and they made it. But I want you to imagine a 40 or a 50 or a 60 foot little sailing vessel in that storm. You, you see, the Mediterranean is just littered with ancient sailing vessels that never made it. And so when Paul says, I've decided to spend the winter there, it's because there was very little travel in the wintertime in the Mediterranean. You see, this is a real letter dealing with real issues, with real people, dealing with real times and real places. Um, it is good for us to recognize that the whole Bible is like this, that when a place is mentioned in the Bible, you might go, oh, I don't know where that is, and it doesn't really matter. Well, no, it might matter. It may, in fact, have something to do with the meaning of the text. And the second thing I want us to recognize from this, and we see it in verses 12 and in verses 13, is this. Paul goes from condemning, fill this in, condemning false leaders to commending faithful leaders. And it's important for Sheridan Hills to recognize that sometimes it is appropriate to condemn a false leader. And it is also appropriate to commend faithful leaders. And that's exactly what Paul is doing when he shifts in this. So the next four guys, that he, he is just, we've been studying all of these false leaders that are leading the churches wrong, and that's why the churches are so messed up. He's condemned all of those guys, and now he's saying, hey, here's four names that are gonna be helpful to you. 
Um, here's four names that you need to be aware of. Look at verse 12. It says, when I send Artemis and Tychus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis. Here's the picture. In verse 12, and fill this in, Paul tells Titus that either Artemis or Tychus are coming to, underline it, relieve him. So the idea is Paul is going to send these two faithful, one of these two faithful servants to carry on the work. So Titus isn't going to stay there forever. He's a, mission, he's a moving missionary that's, that's also helping Paul. But Artemis, what do we know about Artemis? We know nothing about Artemis, hardly at all, only that he was apparently up for this kind of a task. So not just anybody could go in and deal with a bunch of difficult churches. Look at the next name that are, or it was going to be Tychus. Much is known about Tychus. He's mentioned several times in the New Testament and always very favorably. In Acts 20, he's on the missionary journey with Paul from Corinth to Asia Minor. Look at Colossians 4, 7. He delivered Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. In 2 Timothy 4, 12, we see he replaced Timothy at Ephesus. In Ephesians 6, 21, he goes back to Ephesus for Paul. And then look in verse 21. Look what it says. Paul is writing to the people at Ephesus. And in verse 21, he says, Tychus, the beloved brother, underline that, beloved brother, and faithful servant in the Lord will tell you everything so that you may know about me and what I am doing. So here's part of the picture. I want you to see that the New Testament has this comprehensive story that really is fit together. The book of Acts and Ephesians and Paul is writing these various letters that we see these same characters often showing up. Some we don't know very much about like Artemis, but Tychus we begin to see is, is active for that. Now why does that matter to us? We see that in the life of Sheridan Hills and we see that in the mission work around the world that there are faithful people that we send to different places to do different tasks and that is the case even right now and some of you might be a Tychus or a Priscilla and Aquila who are being called out to go and to serve the Lord in another place somewhere along the way Tychus was called to be in league with what God was doing in the world or Artemis was was called to do that some of you are being prepared and called to do that God is going to send you out from a solid church to go to a place where there's un, where, where, where the work hasn't been established or the work was established and it's messed up and God's going to call you to go and to love the people and show the people and to preach the word and that his word is going to go to a new place and be established in a new place because of what he did with you here. There are some wives that you're starting to sense God's call to do what God is calling you to do. As the word has been changing you and as you look at your family and you look at the call of the Great Commission around the world, you're starting to say, wow, I'm kind of open to that. I don't understand or I'm burdened for that or I'm, my heart is broken for that or I'm thrilled with that. And the way that it works very often is that a husband or a wife looks at the other and says, I, I, I don't know, but I feel like we need to pray about these people or we need to pray for this area of the world or we need to pray for what does God want to do with us and with our family. And if you go back and you interview missionary after missionary and pastor after pastor, you see that under the preaching of the word, God's Holy Spirit begins to call us out. And there's some people in this church that are saying, I feel called to support and to pray for these people more and more. I want to give so that they can go. And if the Lord wants me to go, I'll go, but I'm, I'm willing to do that. You see, that's what a mission-minded, gospel-centered, Christ-centered church does. And we see that commending faithful leaders is part of that. Look at verse 13. Paul tells Titus, look at verse, excuse me, look at the outline part where it says verse 13. Paul tells Titus to take care of Zenos and Apollos as they pass, pass through. Now look at, the, look at the verse there at the top of the page in verse 13. Do your best to send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. Now what's interesting about these two, apparently these, these two dudes are traveling together, and listen, they apparently are the ones who are showing up with the letter of Titus, for Titus, from Paul. So they apparently are the guys who are hand-delivering, fill that in, they are hand-delivering this very letter to Titus. And so Titus's, Paul's words to Titus are, hey, 
The guys that just showed up with the letter, make sure you take care of them, let them get rested up, and then send them on their way for where they need to go and what they need to do. Now, Zenus the lawyer. We don't know hardly anything. Like Artemis, we don't know anything about um, Zenus the lawyer except that he had Paul's trust. Um, was he a Roman litigator, like an actual attorney? Possibly. Was he, Jewish, was he a Jewish expert on Mosaic law? Possibly. Doesn't matter that his name is a Greek name. He could have still been a Jew. There were many Jewish people that took Greek names. So we, we don't know exactly who he was or what kind of a lawyer was. We just know that he was traveling with Apollos and that he was trustable. Apollos, different story. We know a lot about Apollos. And it's a very beautiful, in fact, you can study this this afternoon. Go and look up and study a little bit about, from Acts 28 and 1 Corinthians chapter 1 um, about Apollos. Apollos is the one that in 1 Corinthians it says, you know, uh, some of you say I'm of Apollos, some of you say I'm of Paul, some of you say I'm of Jesus. And the Apostle Paul is challenging all of them saying, be unified. Well, part of that is because Apollos apparently was a faithful preacher first of Jewish belief and John the, John the Baptist baptism, but then Aquila and Priscilla took Paulus off to the side and explained to him the whole story, and he began preaching Jesus Christ fully as Savior and, and Lord of the of the universe. He, he, nobody had ever told him that, and so, but he had been faithful in that, and so we see that Apollos is coming bringing the letter. Now, here's how it applies to us, very quickly. We too must fill it in, identify, embrace, and support faithful, godly leaders. That's what the church is called to do. The church is called to identify them. You need to know who they are. You, you need to know who they are in comparison to those who, are, who aren't. And put out there to the side Titus 1. That's part of what Titus 1 was all about. You remember in Titus 1 when we looked over the, the qualifications of the elder pastor? That, there's, there's a list that is there. In Timothy, we see the list. In, in 1 Peter, we see the list where we see these lists given of who is considered a faithful leader. So the church's job is to identify those and to embrace them and see them as God. 1 Corinthians says that these are God's gift to the church and support um, them and to follow them. You see, and some of these leaders stay to lead us. These are called pastors or elders, and some of them go to lead others. So fill all that in. Some stay to lead us. They're pastors and elders, and some of them go to lead others. Those are what we often call missionaries. But either way, we need to identify, embrace, and support those whom God is raising up to declare and to help the church to be all that God has called it to be. So, number two, Paul has moved from condemning false leaders in the letter to commending faithful leaders, and we even see some of their names. Number three, very quickly as we end. Number three, Christians, and we see this in verse 14, Christians must learn to commit themselves to live productive lives of caring for others. Christians must learn to commit themselves to live productive lives of caring for others. Now look at verse 14. Look what it says. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. We often have said, idle hands are a, do you know what that t title is, do you know what it is? Idle hands are a devil's workshop. Let's say that out loud. Idle hands are a devil's workshop. Um, that's not scripture, it's just a, a nice saying in Europe and in, in America. Um, you know, when people are not being productive, they get in trouble. When your kids don't have something to do that's kind of important, you know, you, you look at that. Have you ever noticed that, that you, you, they get in trouble when they're not busy kind of working on something that you have told them to work on? Um, puppies are that way. 
if puppies don't have the right stuff, what do they do? They are cats. Cats can do the same thing from what I understand. Not a cat lover. I know some of y'all are. That's fine. Um, you got your own problem. But anyways, <laughs> I, you know, whatever. Um, you know, idle nature here very often brings about problems. That is very true for Christians. When Christians are not doing what God has designed them to do, their hearts can become downcast, their faith can grow cold, their, their love can grow cold. In fact, the, the enticements of the world can start to get their attention and draw them away from the things that are true. You know, if we get busy doing what God has told us to do, and we see this in verse 14, that if we will learn to devote ourselves to what is called good works, then we often will stay out of a lot of trouble as God's people. Um, notice this, um, and the breakdown of this verse is right here. Our people. Who's our people? That's the church. That's church members. I'm going to say there, that's true Christians. So when, when Paul is saying, remind our people, let our people, he's talking about the people in the Cretan churches that really are part of the true faith. And look at the next word that is there, learn. See, it's not just let our people devote themselves. They have to learn to devote themselves. It's not automatic. Fill that in. It's not automatic. It must be taught and it must be learned. You see, we'd be a bad church if we didn't challenge you to learn to devote yourselves to Christ in doing the right thing. You have to learn that. It's not just, oh, I'm devoted now. I remember in Arkansas, that church in Arkansas, we, we were going to have a big revival time, big week set aside for prayer and pre preaching and all that. And I remember our first prayer meeting, we had this, you know, we we're going to pray for like the next month. And I'll never forget one of the guys sitting around the table. We all bowed for prayer and we just opened with a word of prayer. And um, we took him to it. And he just looked up and he goes, all right, I'm revived. I'm revived. I don't, I, it happened, just happened. I'm revived. And I thought, wow, really? Maybe, but I don't think so. I mean, the, the, the picture was, you know, this isn't just like automatic, instantaneous. Um, we have to learn to walk with the Lord. We have to learn to discipline ourselves. We have to learn to choose Him over the world. And then, because of this next part is hard, devoting themselves, it says, that we devote ourselves. This means of our will. Fill that in. Of our will. This is, it's not necessarily what we want. It's not necessarily our, our emotions. It's the decision of our heart. You see, it goes against how you feel by discipline and commitment. You know, the football player doesn't always feel like going to practice. I mean, sometimes he likes it, but there's a lot of times he's thinking, oh, man, these two-a-days are killing me. And he's sitting there thinking, I don't want to do this. But he, by discipline, goes and he submits himself through that commitment. I just want you to see in this verse, he says in verse 14, and let our people learn to devote themselves. Church family, we have to devote ourselves. We have to learn to do that. And that is an ongoing process. Look at the next part there. And devote ourselves to what? To good works. Throughout this letter, we have seen this, the idea of good works. If you read the book of James, you know that faith without works is dead. And it's not works that hopefully will save you. It's works that are a proof that you are saved. Look what it says here. Good, good works. This is faith and love in action. This is right living. This is the, some of the things that the Apostle Paul was attacking in the Cretan churches. That they weren't acting like Christians. He says, you, you're supposed to act like Christians. This is self-sacrifice for others. This is Christ-likeness. Church family, we don't want to be like the unreformed Cretan churches. We want to be like what I believe was what the Cretan churches would become, was that their leadership would be good and their people would believe the right things. And listen, they would devote themselves to living for Christ. 
This is honoring to the Savior. This is what Christians are to do. Christians aren't to sit and just watch Netflix endlessly like the rest of the culture, allowing all the values and all of the wants and all of the humor and all of the other things that come from people in other places who don't love God affect all of your likes and your dislikes. You see, it's that Christians are to learn to devote themselves to the truth and not let their children simply watch all of the stuff of the culture and do all of the things of the culture and the values of the culture and your children be carried away from God. Christians are to live in good works and when we live in good works, we're serving others. That is part of what community groups is all about that we would love and care for one another. And as we love it, and you see, look at verse 14 on your outline. Look at verse 14. And let our people learn to devote themselves to what? To good works. Why? Says it at the end of verse 14. Read it out loud. So as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. You know what the bottom line is? Everybody has urgent needs. Some of you are saying, well, I don't. Well, you've just forgotten. Or yours is coming. It, we, we all have things. We all have either children that we're struggling with, maybe even adult children that we're heartbroken with, or parents that we're struggling to take care of, or or some hurt from the past, or, or there's, there's a job loss, or there's a health problem, or there's a, there's a persecution issue, or there's, a, you know, there's, there's something physically or mentally that we're struggling with. We all have urgent needs. The picture is this, is that the body of Christ is to be together, caring for one another, exalting Christ as we show Christ's likeness. So may we be true Christians. That's what this letter is all about. Have the right leaders, believe the right things, and live them out, showing the world who Christ really is. Two key questions. The first one is this. Do you put God's real and relevant word into your daily practice? Are you living out God's word? In order to do that, you have to know it. So the question is, are you spending time in his word? Do you read his word? Are you studying his word? Are you coming to know his word? But my first question to you is, do you, if you claim to be a Christian, do you practice his word daily? And then the next key question that you may want to talk about at lunch, you may want to talk about, are you committed to following God's leaders in serving God's people. God gives us leaders for a reason. God gives us leaders to help us. Not just one leader, but multiple leaders. He's done it wisely. He gives us leaders, and He also gives us a task, and it is to serve others. Some of you would say, well, I need a place to serve in the life of the church. Go back to the back and sign up. We would be glad, or you put it on a card. We would be glad to help you serve in the life of the church. We have community groups. I want to encourage you to go pick up your new packet. It is, it's a directory in there. There's one, if you're a Covenant Church member, you just go over there and look it up by zip code, and you can get it. I mean, it, it has, look at this. This is the coolest thing. Marcy and the, and the ladies have worked on this very, very hard, so it's, it's newly organized. Everybody in your community group, there, there they are. You can go see the funny-looking people in their community group and that lived around the corner from your house. These are, this is my community group. These are the, they're not funny-looking. They're beautiful. Um, but, and, you know, we, we desire to love and to pray for one another and to care for one another and to support one another as we fill out and live out this, this passage of Scripture in our lives. So may Christ come and do that in us. Would you stand with me for prayer?